uh, I want to start off for you guys with, with a question today. And so the question that I have is kind of a, I don't know, it's a weird one, but I will go for it. Uh, what do you think it would take to change the world? What do you think that it would take to change the world? What if we could keep things like the Civil War, which had 620,000 casualties? Keep in mind, that's a war we fought against ourselves. What would it take to see things like the Holocaust, which had somewhere between 15 and 20 million casualties? What would it take to see something like slavery and segregation in the South, which has an undocumented number of casualties, and something like the Native American Removal Act of 1830, which essentially forced Native people to move from the only place they had ever known to the God-forsaken land of Oklahoma. <laughs> I'm sorry if you're from Oklahoma. I lived there for a year. I just didn't enjoy it all that much. But on that trail, they call it the Trail of Tears, 3,000 plus people died. What would it take to see things like that just not happen? Could we ever get to that point? Now, you could take a look back at history and you could say, well, if we knew all we knew now, and if we had different leaders, or if we'd responded faster, uh, then none of these things would have ever happened. And this may be true, but I have to tell you something. Long before Hitler ever walked the earth, uh, there was this guy named Jesus. And Jesus had a pretty important message for us. Uh, you can go throughout the Bible and study different things, and he tells us to do different things. He tells us to live life a certain way. But he really only commanded us to do two things, and they kind of work together. He commanded us multiple times in Scripture to love God and to love our neighbor. So as I think about that, uh, I reflect on confirmation. Uh, I was the one that taught confirmation class, which is, if you're not familiar with that, it's essentially a, a class that young kids have to go through before they can become a full established adult member in church. Uh, and so I got to teach 12 weeks of that class, and essentially they just, they get a, a basic understanding of, of Christian belief and a basic understanding of, of what United Methodists believe and what it takes to be a member in the church. And so... Uh, we went through that class, and when we started that class, I have to tell you, my only hope was that when these kids grow up and they become big and famous kids, and they become the president of the United States, or they run for president of the United States, that they would at least be able to say the books of the Bible correctly, and not stand up in front of a crowd and call 2 Corinthians 2 Corinthians. That's a joke. You can laugh. Uh, that was my hope, at least, was that they would be able to do that. But as we progressed and as we went through the process... Of, of what confirmation is, it, it, it reminded me of something, and, and I think that's kind of what lies at the heart of, of what we're gonna talk about today. And it, it's this idea that as Christians, as people seeking to follow Christ, we're not commanded to be perfect, and we're not supposed to demand perfection from other people. We are commanded to love. And I say this because I believe that if we study scriptures, uh, this idea of holiness that we're gonna talk about today is, is actually not about perfection, as much as it is about motivation. Perfection is a prideful motivation. To live authentically, to love authentically, is motivated by humility. Holiness is not defined by our moral code or a set of rules that we subscribe to. Holiness is defined by our ability to give and receive love from God and our ability to give and receive love to and from others. Everything we do should flow from our desire to love. So I know that this might seem like kind of an odd concept, and it might go against some things that you've heard, but I believe that if we study Jesus' teachings and what he lays out for us, we find that these are two values that he is consistently affirming, love of God and love of neighbor. And so as we dig into scripture today, uh, there are two stories that we're going to, not that we're going to look at, but there are two stories essentially that really hammer this point home. And they're, they're more, uh, rather than two separate stories, they're more two versions of the same story. One's found in Matthew, one's found in Mark. And we're going to be looking at the one from Mark today. And so essentially what it is, is it's, it's Jesus in the temple teaching. And some people come and ask him a few questions. And he answers them. Uh, but 
the questions they ask aren't like a student asking a teacher a question. They're more of, I'm gonna try to make a fool of this guy by asking him a question he can't answer type questions. So Jewish teachers, uh, Jewish beliefs and teachings said that there were a certain amount of laws you had to follow. Now as Christians, we probably think the Ten Commandments, right? Well, in reality, Jews actually had 631 religious laws that they were supposed to follow in order to remain pure, right? That's pretty crazy, 631. And if you mess up one time, it's kind of done. A little, little weird. So in spite of all that, in spite of this being kind of a trick that they're playing on him, uh, Jesus actually responds and gives a orthodox, meaning right, teaching, and logical answer. And so let's check that out for ourselves. Today's text, like I said, comes from Mark. If you don't know much about the book of Mark, what you really need to know is that it's the oldest of the Gospels. It was the first one written, somewhere around AD 70, I believe. Uh, there are three Gospels that function kind of in a similar way. They have the same themes, the same stories, and that's Mark, Matthew, and Luke. So Mark's the oldest, and Matthew and Luke both draw off of Mark. But Mark is also the shortest, and you guys are going, yes. Mark is the shortest, and it moves the quickest. So it's Jesus really going through Jesus' life, telling about miracles he performed, telling about stories he told, the parables, things of that nature. And it's short, which is awesome. My professor that taught my Synoptic Gospels class in college actually called Mark uh, Jesus' action movie. And he would say that that's because it moves quick, it burns hot, and it gets to the point fast, right? So we're gonna kind of play off a little bit of that today. So I'm gonna read for you Mark 12, 28 through 34 right now. So if you have your Bible and you wanna open it up, or there's some in front of the pew there, or you can read it on the screen behind me, check this out. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. Seeing that he had answered them well, he asked him, the scribe asked Jesus, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Therefore, there is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and there was no one besides him. And to love him with all your hearts, and with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. I have to start with this. I just think that's a super cool ending to a Bible passage. Jesus was such a boss that he was able to uh, answer this guy's question and then everybody was like, yeah, I'm never talking to that guy again. What the heck, man? I knew what he was talking about. But aside from that, what we have set before us here is one of many interactions that Jesus has with religious leaders of his time. Jesus had been in the temple teaching, participating in worship, a custom that he often kept to. And after being confronted concerning his beliefs on the resurrection, a Pharisee who had seen Jesus teaching in the temple and was intrigued by him asked him the question, which of God's commandments is the most important? Now, as I stated before, this starts off kind of as a trick question uh, because he doesn't even know the answer. So in, in, in Jewish history, in Jewish law, there's actually three uh, major groupings of religious leaders. You have the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and then people called the scribes who were essentially just experts. They were lawyers. They knew the ins and outs of the law. And so the guy that Jesus is talking to, some translations say Pharisees, some translations say scribe. What we know for sure is that he's a religious leader. And he asked Jesus a question that he knows most religious teachers wouldn't dare answer because they don't have the answer and they don't agree on the answer. And so he asked Jesus this question anyway, knowing this. And Jesus, being the smart person that he is, uh, actually somehow answered it pretty well with a suitable answer for him. And uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know why he did it because if you have 631 rules and you can't even agree on which one is the right one or which one's the most important, then... Why would you ask someone else? But in spite of that, he did, and Jesus gives a good answer. And that might have to do with the fact that Jesus is God and that Jesus was probably the only person that ever lived that had a complete understanding of this concept. And so Jesus pretty much lays it out for him. And for someone who had rather unorthodox methods of, of ministering to people, especially in his context, in his time, uh, Jesus gives a surprisingly orthodox or, or right 
believing answer according to this guy. So uh, Jesus actually quotes a prayer that love, your, love the Lord your God, love with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's actually a prayer that's used to start and end Jewish religious services. It's called the Shema, and it comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6. So the Shema is a complete orthodox and accepted piece of Jewish ritual, uh, and it was actually a prayer rooted in dedication to love and to God. In its original context, it spoke directly of devotion to God. In fact, the phrase in its original context actually means to give oneself over completely, to be completely devoted. So Judaism, it's just funny that we say this, because Judaism was, Judaism was notorious for placing its holy rituals, holy rituals over the very key to holiness, love and devotion for God and love and devotion for neighbor. You see, from the beginning, the law, as Jews are supposed to understand, it was actually a relational covenant between God and the people of Israel. It was meant to allow them to continue to engage God, even though he was holy and they were not. But, like many things, uh, man came in and twisted and contorted and distorted something that God intended for good and turned it into something uh, far more uh, constrictive and bad than good. So rituals, rules, and prideful behavior modif modification became more important than seeking a relationship with God. Somewhere along the line, for Jews at least, holiness became more about a moral code and less about a relationship. It is here that Jesus brings to light and enlightens the Pharisee to this truth. Our motivation for holiness is just as important as the actions involved. Holiness is not motivated by pride and obedience. It's motivated by engagement, affection, and humility. The Pharisee is surprisingly accepting of Jesus' answer. He even affirms it. But we don't know if he fully understood it or not because he never actually professes faith in Jesus. So he says, yes, teacher, you have it right. But he doesn't go as far as to say that Jesus is Jesus, essentially, that he's the Savior, that he is the Messiah. And so that's where he's missing it. That's why Jesus says he's close to the kingdom of God, not actually in the kingdom of God. So you kind of look at that and you go, well, that's great. Um, I have kind of an illustration I want to use to help with this point. So as humans, we tend to think that the best way to do things is to go in a straight line, put our blinders on, and get to point, from point A to point B as quick as we can, as fast as we can. Well, uh, a lesson that I learned early on in my life, when I was in high school, I did a lot of sailing, and I did everything from small boats that you used in races that were super lightweight, super fast, and you actually had to like hang off the side in order for them to like stay balanced while you were sailing, so your back like skimmed in the water was all kinds of really cool stuff, it was fun. Uh, but we also did, uh, I also sailed large boats. I'm talking like stuff that could have been a pirate ship and then numerous other like modern type sailboats. And one of the things that you learn rather early on in that is that you do not get to control where you go. So you might want to go in a straight line, but you don't get to control where you go. The wind does because the wind is what powers your boat. So you can try to go in a straight line all you want to, but if the wind's not blowing that direction, you're not going to get there. You're just going to sit there and you're going to look like a dork because you're Sails flapping in the wind and everything's going crazy and you're trying to figure it out. Sometimes when you sail, you actually have to make more of a jagged course, kind of like this. And so you start out and you go as far as you can one way and then when you get to a certain point, you say, okay, we have to do something called a tack, which is essentially where you turn and you push your sails into the wind and you start going another direction. And so you do that and you actually end up doing something that looks kind of like this. So rather than going from here to here, you're going from here to here to here to here. Right? It takes, a little, it takes a while. Our uh, Sea Scout leader always used to say, uh, if you're in a hurry, don't take a sailboat. And so the only, I say that because I think that we try to pursue holiness this way. I think we try to define holiness this way. Holiness ends up becoming some journey that we're on where if we do these set things and we follow these set rules and we do this set stuff, we're gonna get to the end we wanna get to. And I would actually argue that based off of scripture and based off of what, how I interpret that and what the Bible says, that holiness probably actually looks something more like this rather than that, right? And so uh, holiness is about following God's path, not our own. Holiness is about allowing God to transform you in his way, in his time, and into his image. Not what you believe it should be. Holiness is about following God and allowing him to define everything about us. So this morning, you say, that's great, 
what am I going to do with this? Excuse me. You essentially, sitting in the room, you have three categories you can fall into. Uh, you can fall into the category that says, this dude standing up here with a microphone and a tie is absolutely nuts, and I don't want to believe anything he says. There's some people that probably wouldn't blame you for that. You can fall into a second category, which is more of the undecided category. You can say, eh, there might be some merit to what he's saying, but I'm not real sure yet. And there's a third category, and those are the people that are already starting to think about what I'm talking about. Those are the people that are starting to process it and go, oh, well, maybe, maybe that is there. And so if you fall into that first category, and, and I've said something that's thrown you off or made you crazy or something like that, I, I apologize, that wasn't my intention, um, but the rest of what I'm going to say is probably not going to make a whole lot of sense to you because you've already decided that the beginning, the premise of the message is, is not valid. So I'm really now going to start to speak, and we're going to talk about application, and we're going to talk about the two people, the two groups of people that are trying to figure out what they're going to do with this. So uh, the first point in your little fill-in there that you're going to see says this. Our focus on holiness should be in light of God's work, not our own. Apart from the love of the Father, the sacrifice of Christ, and the transformation of the Holy Spirit, holiness is completely unattainable for us. No amount of service, worship, sin management, or righteous acts make you worthy of the glorious standard that God has set forth for you. Let me be clear. Nothing you do on your own makes you worthy of being holy. Nothing you do on your own makes you worthy of being holy. Holiness is only attainable because of God, and you and I are powerless to do anything about our sin. No matter how hard we try, we will always have a sin problem. Only Jesus relieves that burden. When we choose to identify as his followers, as followers of Christ, as children of God, we become holy. Nothing else makes holiness attainable for us. Only Jesus. Focus, oh, sorry, this is point number two. Focus on holiness in the context of love. The actions we perceive to be holy, reading our Bible, journaling, prayer, worship, attending church, reciting liturgy, singing songs, uh, become less ritualistic uh, when we view them through the lens of acts of affection towards God. They are not mandatory rituals, but acts of love used to communicate our devotion. Even acts of social justice, service, human benefit, acts of mercy are done with God's love in mind. We serve others because our love of God motivates us to do so. Even, uh, even when we confront sin and misplaced belief or understanding, we need to understand that God deeply loves the person we're talking to. And so if we're going to tell someone, hey, you're not living your life right you may not be pursuing holiness, that has to come out of a relationship and a love that we have for that person. So if I try to go up to someone that I don't know, you know, I see a guy walking down the street with a bottle of rum or something in a brown bag, and I try to tell him that he's an alcoholic and he's drinking too much and that he needs to change his life, he's probably not gonna respond real well. But if somebody that I've been living life with, that I've been walking through life with, that I see struggling with that, and I sit him down and I say, Tell me about your life, man. What's, what's going on? What's, what's the deal with this? They're going to respond a whole lot better to that than, than us just trying to tell them how to live their life. When we love our neighbor, we are essentially enacting the love that God has for that person. So some people's expression of love that they receive from God is only going to come through the expression of love that they receive from you. It's not fair. It's not right. But that's the way it works. Some people's only interaction with God is the interaction they have with people who say that they follow God. We sacrifice and we put our motivations in line with God. That's what it means to pursue holiness in the context of love. Finally, our third point. Holiness is a reorientation of thought, not a new line of thinking. And so chances are at some point, We've all heard this message before. On some level, we've all heard, you know, love this, hate the sin, love the sinner, pursue grace, you know, all that good stuff. Uh, we've all heard it. But 
what I want to communicate to you is that you've probably at some level embraced it too. So you don't have to completely reorient your thinking. You don't have to completely reorient what, you're, what you perceive. Instead, it's more probably just a nudge or a realignment. And so instead of trying to follow rules, per se, focus on the next step that God is calling you to so that you can engage him in a deeper relationship. That's what he wants for us. Be intentional about developing intimacy with God. Holiness is as much about our motivation as it is our actions. So as we kind of move towards our conclusion and I wrap this up, I'm gonna, I got a quote I want to share with you. This is from a, a guy by the name of A.W. Tozer. And he wrote about 50 to 60 years ago. But every time I read something that he writes, it just completely blows me away because he, he just speaks to our cultural context and our people very, very well. And it's, it's just, it just blows my mind. So here's this for you. Uh, holiness as taught in the scriptures is not based upon knowledge on our part. Rather, it's based upon the resurrected Christ indwelling us and changing us into his likeness. And so in closing, I want you to prayerfully consider what I'm laying before you today. I get that this may not come naturally to everyone. Our worldviews have been shaped through our experiences, our conversations, the books we read, the sermons we hear, the Sunday school lessons we attend, the people we interact with. And I am not so arrogant as to think that what I am saying to you today will have a dramatic impact on your life. What I do believe and what I do hope and pray for is that God uses this as a reminder to inspire transformation in your lives. Holiness shouldn't be a burden. It should be a joy. It should be the reason we find joy in this life, not the reason we fear the consequences of life. So as we close, which path do you choose? Are you going to continue, necessarily not to say that you are, but if you are, are you going to continue to try to, by your own strength, by your own willpower, by your own fear, by your own pride, keep pushing forward trying to follow this set of rules that you know are completely unattainable? Standards that you have that you know you could never reach? Or are you going to embrace the fact that there may be something better out there? There may be something easier, bigger, right? Something that's not confining and something that actually gives you freedom and joy to pursue life. Because that's what holiness is. Holiness is not binding. Holiness is about freedom. And it empowers us to pursue life the way God intended us to. And that is why it's so awesome. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you in this time and we lift this time up to you, God, and we say thank you. Lord, we love you. We're so blessed by you. We're so blessed that you sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. And we're so blessed to acknowledge that we don't have to follow a ritualistic set of laws and that our actions aren't alone what we are judged by, but that we are judged merely on our ability to embrace your son and to love you and out of that love for you to seek and to move forward uh, through this life and do our best to love our neighbors as we care for ourselves. And so God, we submit our hearts to you today as we pursue holiness together. God, may you speak to each of us individually and reveal to us the next step. May we move forward from this place, acknowledging your glory and your presence. We love you. In your name we pray, amen.